Call the meeting of order here at about 502. First thing is roll call. to number three, which is the election of officers. So my term has expired. Uh, the way we did this last year, as I recall, is put it right up front. There's not a lot of procedure outlined in the new rules that we, uh, or in the uh, policies and procedures that we have for the Board of Trustees. So I assume we'll do the same way we did last time, and that is we'll take nominations from the floor for president first and then for secretary. So I will open it up. Are there any Anybody that would like to make a nomination? I would. I would like to nominate Katie as okay. president. Okay. Is there a second for that? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved to nominate or to, yes, to nominate uh, Katie Clark as new president of the board. It's been seconded by Jason Capella, moved by Bessie Kahn. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 I think it's tacky to vote for yourself, is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next we have the... You're not putting uh, nay, are you? No. <laughs> Just to be clear. No. That motion carries. And before I pass the gavel, I think we should do the secretary uh, nomination as well. So are there any, any nominations from the floor for secretary? Yeah, I know. Can't do it. Well, I would then like to nominate Jason for that. <laughs> So they get for opening my mouth, yeah, isn't it? that's right. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, so it's been moved by me to nominate Jason as secretary, seconded by Katie. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 So moved. Congratulations, you two. <laughs> and with that, I will formally, I think this is why the gavel was given to me, is to pass it on to you <laughs> to get out this little package. I haven't really banged it much this year. You need to find some excuses to use it. Right. Thank you very much. And congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to move over and let you take this oh, seat. Oh, you can stay where you are. Can you? Come over there, Katie. All yeah, right. I think, <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, think, I think that's another that's way That's the deal. Go. Okay. Jason, you want to move over? One, two as well. Is there an official seat for the secretary? Of the I don't think so. No, but we're not boy, girl, boy, girl. Like we're not boy, girl. No swearing in ceremony. It's usually, uh, I, 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 The men are on the right and the women are on the left. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Next year. Yeah, right. That means no, no foreign trips when you're the board meeting. I haven't missed a meeting yet. Right. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> I carefully plan. I'd like right. to welcome my new neighbor, Terry <laughs> Andrews. <laughs> oh, I think you're right. right. I did have a public comment. I want to know, can you have a board meeting at the branch one time? We totally can. Um, well, thank you very much. I was not really prepared for that, but I appreciate it. And in my first official act, I would like to thank Terry for all of his hard work over the past year. And if I could ask for just a moment of Especially the first half of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. All right. So moving on to item number four, our consent calendar. Um, what I'd like to do is ask for a motion to approve the consent calendar, and then we can take a minute and uh, discuss anything we'd like to pull from that. So moved. I'll second. Perfect. Moved and seconded. So is there any discussion on anything from the consent calendar? This is anything on items pages 3 to 25. Comments. Um, I'll just kind of go through them. So the first um, 
from Stella's report from the public services. I was really excited. I didn't, maybe I just missed that we had applied for this. Um, but getting the, uh, I don't know if it's a grant, but the California State Library Mental Health Initiative, getting approval for five of our staff to participate in that training. I think especially in light of our conversation at the last meeting around you know, some of the issues we're dealing with in our community, I think it's just awesome just to even have the foresight to look, look into that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing after they participate in that. And I see here too, you know, part of that includes bringing back that curriculum and, and sharing it with the rest of the staff. Um, really just, and I think it really falls in line with the strategic plan as well, right? Just making sure we are able to do everything possible to meet the needs of the community. So I just want to thank the staff for, for, for being on top of that. Um, and then on the, the branch report, um, you know, it's exciting to see that we continue to bring uh, new folks from the community into the literacy program. Um, and then I'm really excited uh, speaking on that. Um, some of the ideas that we're hearing from the community as far as our re reimagining our library's work that I think will actually go a long way to further supporting the literacy program at, at the Lucas branch. Um, and then on the volunteers report, I'll apologize. I personally have not put in my time. Um, and I know it'll show up in next month's report, but I, I feel like uh, I just wanted to thank all the volunteers from Saturday's event. You know, the fact that the library gets to play such a big role in, frankly, the largest event, the Christmas tree lighting, um, and to see so much done at the library that's completely dependent on volunteers for an event that really raises the profile of all of Altadena is, is amazing. Um, and then the last two comments um, from Teen Services. Uh, you know, I know community outreach is a huge part, I keep, is a huge part of our strategic plan going forward. So seeing the report on the outreach to John Muir High School and some clear plans to you know, uh, continue that is really good to see. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of discussion on this, but I'm really excited to see on the children's report this diverse book finder project and really, I mean, seeing how we're able to do a complete accounting of the diversity of every single book in our collection is pretty impressive. Um, and, and again, the fact that we're paying attention to that is, is good to see. So those are the comments I have. I've got a couple and some of it is is echoing and extending some of the things that Jason just said about the mental health training I would love it if the if the staff people who go through that could then come back and share some of that with us as well I mean I think that would be good for us to know about and by the same token I would be thrilled if if any of the literacy students and tutors might be willing to come and tell us a little bit about uh, their work together, that would be great. Um, I, I ha when I read the thing about Muir, I, I had a question which is, um, I'm wondering uh, what proportion of, um, atten of uh, enrollment Altadena might have at Marshall as well, because that's a citywide um, school. So I, I might just suggest that um, Isabel take a look at Marshall possibly as another a place to connect with administration. I'm very good friends with the librarian there, so I can certainly help connect her to the library at Marshall. Um, Christopher, I always have questions for you. Uh, what does I sell mean, Christopher? <laughs> oh, there you are, coming to the mic. Of course you would, because you're a technology guy. Uh. The ICEL is a unit that the library originally received from, I think, a water conservation grant uh, that uh, I don't recall the exact price. I didn't. I wasn't involved in that, but it was like seven to nine thousand uh, dollars. That is what that unit costed. At the end of the uh, uh, grant cycle, uh, well. 
it started to rain and water <laughs> conservation became less of an issue. So what we did was we reskinned the, the, the unit that we had Is received. Is that the marquee thing? Yes, it has. Yeah, you know what? I asked this last week, but I asked what reskinning was, and I didn't really pay attention to what I saw was last yeah. week. So what it is, is it's a, basically a TV, and you hover your hand over different um, pictures that are on the, uh, the skin of the unit, and it automatically plays videos. So what we did was reskin it so that it had uh, an assortment of library-related uh, categories, such as branch, uh, news, technology, and uh, it's quite large. It's almost like a, a pretty version of Kubrick's monolith. Uh, it's in the basement if you want to see it. So we're trying to find a place for it. Does it have audio? It does. Uh, and when it was deployed out into the main floor, the audio was kind of like annoying for library patrons and staff because it would just push out. So we do have a, um, a pair of stretchy headphones that we will attach to the unit, or that's the idea. Along with sanitary wipes to wipe those headphones down, um, we haven't located an exact spot to deploy the unit to, uh, and it's it's very big. It's like seven foot tall by. Uh, so how do you feet. even reach the top? The picture is about it's about this tall uh -huh. uh, for the video, and uh, it's. <laughs> It's uh, ADA accessible heights for the uh, actual cells that you have your hand over. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And Thank the idea you. will be that we exchange out the uh, the videos that are in there for material videos that are developed by our, our marketing and engagement manager. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to that. And my other question for you was, um, how did you choose the languages that you? that you um, integrated into the library system for translation? Yeah. Uh, Spanish was That's the easiest one to choose. Yeah. As far as the others, I just considered the surrounding area, and I thought Glendale has a pretty large Armenian population, mm -hmm. and Chinese is it's just a, another large population. Korean and there was one other one. French. 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 I just arbitrarily chose those, but uh, we are working. Uh, pre we are working right now on the notification aspect. Uh, there is a drop down that allows you to select those languages and translate the pages. But the notifications, uh, the volunteer coordinator uh, is assisting uh, with our army of volunteers to uh, get those <coughs> translations done, so that patrons will be able to select their notification preferred uh, language on their notifications mm -hmm. and receive those. I just wondered if we had any other way to identify language groups in our service area. Obviously, the census would be one way. Um, yeah, um, yeah, the census would be a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, I I chose those five, um, and I wanted to do all languages that the system was capable of. When I reached out to our support company for our ILS, uh, they were saying that no one has really done it. Yeah, all oh, languages, yeah. so I just chose five. They said the most they'd seen was five, so okay. I so that chose five. Right. But okay. we can always expand that number Interesting. Well. Okay. Um, and my last question, I think I know what it means, but when you're talking about mobile hotspot attrition, does that mean they just that they disappear? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's lost or yeah. stolen. Yeah, or just gone. Gone forever, okay. yeah. Okay. Which is up to six right now. Okay. Uh, we have some... I was speaking with Nikki today about uh, solutions for that attrition that would also help facilitate the Library of Things initiative that we've uh, been wanting to get off the ground for a long time. And so um, we'll probably talk about that later. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for me. Okay. And uh, just a couple things for me. Although some of the things have already been covered, I really like that idea of uh, inventory our diversity in the in the uh, book in the children's section. That's a terrific, a terrific uh, project. So I'm really happy to see that going. Um, to the getting to the um, statistics uh, reports, which I'm I'm happy to see back in the packet. Uh, 
when you look at the first page, which would be 19, um, one of the things I'd like to suggest is that, you, thanks a lot for including the mention that I made about having sort of a business per square foot statistic. I think that's really telling. And what I asked for, uh, what I asked for that originally was really kind of to help the facilities committee understand what's going on. We had some um, comments by people at the meetings that they thought that the Bob Lucas Library was busier, it had more bodies in it, and it was, it was a little, was kind of stressing its limits. So I thought a, a fair uh, adjustment to make on that would be, instead of taking the entire square foot circulation, just do the, uh, the public space. And Jonathan had given me a document that indicated on the main library, it's not 25,950, it's more like 17,620 or something like that. He has the number. So that could be used in a division that that was uh, you know, used to produce that 0.4 visits per square foot. And if you re do that, if you revise it, I came up with 1.58 visits per square foot. And then on the um, Bob Lucas Library, if you take out the storage areas in fairness and the break room there, and you reduce the square footage there as well, I came up with instead of 1,800, 1,464. And those were based on the two scale drawings that we received so far from ARG. And that came up to 1.78 uh, visits per square foot. This could really vary wildly for really from month to month because small changes in Bob Lucas would have a big impact on that number. It would take a lot more for that to happen in the main library. But I was you know, pleased to see that kind of what I thought was happening might be happening, and that is that they're both sort of used you know, with people at about the same rate, according to this. And that was really what I was after in an effort to help guide ARG as they work through, you know, do we have enough square footage, that kind of thing. And then the other items are terrific, uh, you know, it allows us to kind of drill down into what's happening elsewhere. One thing I, I would suggest is that when we look at library cards, um, one, one statistic that would be helpful for me, sort of a, a planning or a goal statistic we, we should have or I'd like to see happen would be how many library cards and what percentage of Alpadina has a library card. So if you do the math the way that I did it, I came up with about 38%, I want to say, I'll have it in front of me. And I had read somewhere, I think it was on the ALA website, but the report's several years old, that about 58% uh, of kids or people 16 years and older have library cards. And uh, so I thought, okay, that's an interesting one. I don't know how accurate it is. You librarians will know a lot more about that. But if we are trying to achieve uh, some sort of a demographic where we have as many library cards issued for our service area as other cities do, I think we should be working in that regard. And then the other part that was, um, I thought, you can think about this and maybe tweak it another way, and that would be they had the library cards for kids 16 and older, for people 16 and older. I'd really be interested in finding out what the library card situation is for people younger than that, because they're going to be the users of the future, so to speak. And uh, just to know a little bit more about that demographic, I think, would be very helpful. Not every month, necessarily, but an occasional report on how we're doing on the library card um, statistic would be beneficial to me. And just so you know, Christopher's going to do a presentation on the Surface Hub, showing you the statistics. Okay. That comes under my report. So. Okay, good. I realized I had two other questions. Go for it, yeah. Um, on, on page 23, I, there are just two things on the list of item types that I don't understand. What, what, is, what are on the fly records? What are those? Oh, first off, uh, I do want to circle back to the notifications and oh. say that. That wasn't my idea originally. That was actually Amanda Toledo's idea to get the, uh, awesome. uh, the multiple languages integrated. Um, the uh, on-the-fly records are uh, a situation where if a record, they go to the staff go to check it out and they can't find it in the catalog, the staff have the ability to create a record right in that moment so that they can oh, immediately check out an item. Okay, I totally get that there. And what 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 are visual materials? DVDs. What does that mean? DVDs. DVDs, oh, got it, okay. So I, I didn't take anything out of these lists, but I just put them in there how we received them. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we 
can adjust if you just want like a shorter list, if you want, you know, like the main books, audio books, magazines, so, you know, we can adjust it, but I just, that's how we receive the statistics yeah. every month, so I just included everything. Okay. I, I, mean, I didn't want to be the one to decide what you want to put in. I, I mean, the more the better t to me. I don't. I, I don't think there's any uh, harm in a long list. I think it might make sense to just call visual materials DVDs, just because if that's what we're talking about, that's a lot clearer. And and I guess can I ask as long as I'm at it? Do audiobooks include physical like CDs and MP3 like downloadables? No, that's just a physical audiobook. So this does not. This is all physical stuff, then. This is no digital stuff. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. And I would like to see the, the virtual stats, so we'll work on that, too. That would be great. Yeah. I did have, like, e-book numbers, and it got cut off because it wasn't included in that chart. I think it got excluded, but going forward, we'll make sure. Jason, did you have a question? No. Just that. Okay. Yeah, so I think most of my questions already got answered, and maybe this is a thing we'll talk, talk about in statistics, but just a, a quick formatting note. Um, for the checkouts by type comparison, the colors and like date sequence is swapped. Everything else is earlier, later, and this is later, earlier, and the oh, colors are back. It's just super confusing. So just. And I wasn't sure if that was if that was correct or if the legend was backwards. So like page twenty five. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You're you're comparing it to these. I'm just at, I, yeah, I'm just asking if the first if if November is first and then October is second is. No, that? yeah, it's just I get what you're saying. Okay. Well, that's correct. Okay. What it's reflecting is correct. It's just. And they're split up because when they're all together, books are so much higher that you can't see like any of the other, you know, like audiobooks, music, all of that. You won't. It doesn't help you visually. I mean, we don't really even need the charts. I just thought maybe. I think it's helpful. I mean, I, I, I would kind of concur that it's nice to see all these different statistics, and maybe over time, after we've done a couple months, we can kind of winnow down if there are things we feel like aren't telling us a helpful story. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's, it's I certainly appreciate it. Um, okay, anything else before we vote um, on the consent calendar? We have a motion and a second. Oh, sure. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. So if I could uh, please get a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, the consent calendar is adopted, which brings us to item six, reports. Um, so we'll start with um, the foundation. Is there anybody from the foundation? The foundation won't be here tonight. Okay, got it. Um, I will pass on Bridges. Uh, Email to me or a text message. I forget. Just uh, thanking everybody for their hard work. Congratulations, for, basically for a good year. One thing that I would add, and I think all of you know that here, and that is that there was that Christmas tree uh, that we have in the front, and that everybody has an opportunity to donate and put a little tree on the on the tree, which I plan to do as well. So any members of the public who didn't know that, uh, be advised that we've got a little fundraising going on right inside the library. I told I would repeat that. All right, so A2, uh, friends, Joy, do you want to come and give a report? Mm -hmm. I'm standing in for Claire tonight. She is in the UK spending the holidays with her mom. I don't have a lot to report, but Christmas Tree Lane was a huge success, and Joy, really it's always... Joy, can you talk right into the mic? Thank you. How is that? That's good. Okay. That's good. Um, Christmas Tree Lane was, uh, is always a lot of fun. And I'm curious if there has ever been an attempt to determine the number of people who attend, because it surely is, is in the 
uh, my husband said 10,000. I don't think there were that many, but certainly several thousand were there. And next year is probably going to be even bigger because that will be the 100th anniversary of Christmas Tree Lane. So those of you who attended may have noticed that there were two, actually I think three trees inside the parking lot that were decorated. I believe this is the first time that trees on library property uh, have had the lights on them and the friends contributed a thousand dollars to make that possible. I especially liked the large tree in the very back that's in the raised bed. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, proceeds from Christmas Tree Lane were a little more than usual. We ended up with about uh, $650. We sell limited categories of books during that sale. Lots of Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa books and media along with the t-shirts and stocking stuffers and, and so forth. This year we also sold the artist Kenny's Tudina calendars, which by the way are available for purchase uh, upstairs in the library and make really wonderful Christmas and holiday gifts. We're selling them actually for $12, which is a little less than they're being sold at Romans, so uh, a bargain here. Uh, the tote bags are also available upstairs, and they're made of recycled plastic, so we're, we're pleased about that. We have given the staff calendars, uh, the Kenny calendars and tote bags, to use as holiday gifts for the volunteers who work in the literacy program at uh, the Bob Lucas. We'll send out membership envelopes in mid-January. We have about 275 memberships, which translates to well over 300 actual members. Our next big event will be the book sale that's now scheduled for February 22nd and 23rd. And in case some of you might not know, the entire uh, 60th birthday party for the Friends and uh, all of the book pitches are now on YouTube, and I've watched it, and it's just as wonderful the second time around. Um, so this is sort of a time of reflection, and on behalf of the friends, I really would like to thank the board and the library administration and all of the staff for your support of the friends. It, it means a lot, and we acknowledge and sincerely appreciate all of your help. It's really the people that make this library such a special place. And on behalf of the friends, I wish all of you a very wonderful holiday season and new year. There's something about the sound of 2020 that makes it uh, seem like it's going to be a really extraordinary year. So thank you very much and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. And please convey our thanks to all the volunteers and everybody who worked so hard at Christmas Tree Lane and indeed all the friends who do so much all year. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to item 6B, uh, the director's report. Mickey, do you want to jump in? We're going to actually start over there with the service awards. Okay. Good. that was put into place I believe in May of this year and we wanted to make sure before the calendar changes that we're um, presenting it to those people that had five, ten, and five, in, five year increments um, related to 2019. So tonight we're actually going to be presenting to five, actually six um, staff and between the six of them we have a combined 150 years of service to the Altadena Library District. 
So the way that um, the policy was written is that we, uh, the direct supervisor of whoever the staff person will present um, on their behalf. Um, unfortunately, Stella is sick tonight, so I'm subbing for her with our first presentation, um, which goes to Debbie Geringer. Want to clap, Debbie? All right, so Debbie started with us in January of 2004. 2004. She was hired as a library clerk, too. Um, she's worked, basically this is the story of all the staff here, pretty much everywhere in the entire system. But this included the collections desk. Um, she's done holds, and then at one point she was in the passports office, and now she's back um, working at our information desk in charge of holds and many other things. Um, her task work has changed over time, and she's also worked at Bob Lucas, she told me today in the past as well. Um, some of her hobbies include uh, loving to going to the beach, reading, movies, and travel. When I asked her, her last trip was to, to Hawaii, which I was very jealous of. And um, a place she really is looking forward to going is the Bahamas and some other Caribbean countries. Overall, uh, Debbie loves to help patrons and do research for them so that everybody that walks out has a smile on their face and definitely wants to come back. So, congratulations, Debbie. You want to come
But just like everyone else I've met with, she loves to work here. She feels like she's made lots of great friends and has really enjoyed helping multi-generations, both at the desk as well as helping issue their passports. So thank you to Tony. Thank you. Thank you. And she decided to raise her family here. 
When people visit the branch, everyone knows Michelle's name, and many of the community knows her. She's a fixture at the branch. She makes the branch feel like the neighborhood library that it is. As one of our regular patrons states, Michelle is the heart of the Bob Lucas Library. She welcomes you with a huge smile when you set foot inside and goes beyond her duty to service the patrons. <laughs> Michelle has a good rapport with all the patrons that walk through the door and the regulars that visit the library on a daily basis. In a time where people are not likely to stick to one job for many years, Michelle has decided to stay with this organization because she values the community she serves and enjoys helping people. She enjoys the bond she has with her fellow co-workers, and she also has a wealth of experience and knowledge. I want to add that I really enjoy working with you because um, you like to joke around and make, we like to joke around together. It makes uh, passing the time faster and more fun. <laughs> and we're so lucky to have you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> So we are planning to start the human resources study in January. I'm in touch with COP and Associates to set up a date, hopefully early January, to kick off. What that means to start will be bringing the management team together as well as all of the staff as two separate meetings to like do an orientation about what a classification and compensation study entails and what that looks like so staff are aware of what it is and feel comfortable with it moving forward. So that will hopefully be wrapped up He's thinking by May. They said it takes about four to five months. So we'll keep you guys updated, um, as well as the staff, on what those dates are going to be when they're set. Um, I'm very excited to have included in my report that we're going to be going with Biblioteca's Cloud Library. Um, this is a new ebook platform, or a different ebook platform. We're currently with Overdrive, but don't have this um, consortia ability that we will with Biblioteca. Um, we're going to launch the new ebook platform on February 18th, which is when we'll transfer all of our content from Overdrive into Cloud Library. And then on the 27th, patrons will have access to the entire Cloud Library, which at this point is over 140,000 volumes. Um, as I mentioned in my report, currently we have access to about 3,800 volumes, so it's, it's many, many, many more. The reason is, is we'll be the 30th library system to join Cloud Library, so we will share all of our resources with the other 29 systems. Which, I thought I'd give a little plug that we made the LA Times last Monday. Yeah, um, and that article was, um, Christopher and I were interviewed to talk about how California is really big on resource sharing. And again, like I emphasized when we talked to the reporter, if we're purchasing these things, we want people to check them out. So the cloud library is a perfect example of how, if our patrons aren't using it, let's let others, and then we'll have access to all of this other information and materials as well. So the virtual statistics should go through the roof. But we'll be promoting that the closer we get to launching. 
can I just add, does that allow us to essentially bypass some of the issues raised in that new article, or is that still, is it not impacted? Well, so the Macmillan embargo is basically what they're calling it. Macmillan's only going to allow um, each library system one copy for the first eight weeks that books are released, especially the bestsellers. Our system, like I would, I'm speaking on Stella's behalf, but I would assume we probably purchase one, maybe two. So it's not impacting us like it does in LA County that has 86 branches and one copy of an ebook that they all have to share. What is nice with Cloud Library though is all 30 of us can purchase one. So like some of their patrons and the bigger systems like San Diego Public is part of Cloud Library, it's to their benefit to be able to share the way that we do. Um, so yes and no, okay. I guess. Um, we can, had I, can I just ask one thing about that? Sure. Just from a patron's perspective, so does that mean on that date in February we basically delete our Libby yes. app and, and add our yes. cloud library app? Yep. Okay. Yep, Libby will no longer be part of our um, offerings, which I think is a good thing too. Again. You don't want to have to search two platforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. What's really nice is with um, the Cloud Library app, it's very seamless. It's going to look like you're checking out from Altadena everything. The patron won't know that it's San Diego's or Anaheim's or whatever. It's just, it, you'll have access to it. Another thing that Cloud Library has introduced is a pay-per-use model. So we're probably going to explore putting some budget towards that, which means it would open up their entire catalog. And if someone wants to check something out, we can pay per checkout as well. So it's it's really great option for us, and it's actually less money than what we were paying Overdrive for the platform fee. So, yeah, really really good. Um, we I also included the new pay period schedule. We did not get the schedule in the packet, so here's a copy of that if you want to go over it as well. And let's see. Um, the only other thing, Terry did mention the Altadena Gibbs Winter Tree. Um, happy to share that in the first week we raised $227. So we definitely encourage everyone to go out there and purchase a tree in support of the foundation. Um, let's see. Lastly, I'm concluding my one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the staff. I think I have about two or three more to go. Um, they have been wonderful. What's really inspired me the most about talking to everyone is when I ask them what their favorite part of working uh, at the library. They either say the community and being able to meet the people walking through the door and helping them every day, and or the staff that they work with. You know, like this group is so outward facing just naturally that it's, it's really inspiring to me how much they love serving the people that work in this community or that live in this community and use our libraries. Okay, so that's it. Kylan did want me to ask about the need for the links in the minutes to the YouTube um, spots in the video, and if that's something that this board wants her to continue doing. It's a very time-consuming process from what I understand, so she just wanted to confirm that that's still something you want to see in the minutes moving forward. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about it. I think the idea originally was that, and this is what our meetings were slightly but that if people wanted to find a particular part, they wouldn't have to go through all you know, three hours. Um, I haven't, I will admit, I haven't looked at our YouTube channel in quite some time, so I don't know what our views are like, but I'm guessing they're not you know, blowing away YouTube's analytics. Only when there's a controversy. Only when there's a controversy. Yeah, and so, and, and like I told Nikki, it was a request from a previous board, and it, you know, it did make sense for certain items that Right. let's say, for people <laughs> to just go and watch that one part of the meeting. But, um, you know, to type up the minutes, I could do that fairly quickly with just my notes. And then if I needed to go back and confirm something or we were, had a question about something that we needed to follow up on, then I would go back to the video. But having to put the links for, like, every item, I pretty much have to sit through, like, three-hour board meeting. You know, and it just, it doesn't seem like a good use of time, you know, for me to sit there at my desk watching this board meeting again, just just to copy that link right. for each item. So I just wanted to know if you guys were using that. So the that. November meeting had three total views, one of which, as we can hear, was kind of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, so, they're, they're out there, so it's not like you can't view the video, it's just like marginally less convenient. I would say, unless anybody has any major objection, we can I'd say let's let it go, and then if we find out we need it, we can, we can do you it. again. Yeah. Yeah, as long as we can come back, and if there was something that we needed to check on the record, if we could find it, you know, right. I'm happy with that. But I'm with everybody else. I don't think people use that much unless there's, you know, some high controversy item going on. And I, I think it's valuable that we provide it, you know, whether people look at it or not. It's an important public record, but I agree, like, is it? Super critical that three hours of your life every month gets spent yeah, doing that problem. Yeah, I don't know if people are like going to our website to find the minutes to find that item and then click the link, or if they would just go to our YouTube video and kind of scroll through and find it. Right, know. right. Yeah. But just in case a couple weeks from now somebody's watching, to be clear, <laughs> you can still pull up the entire thing on YouTube. We right. just won't have the cut and paste pieces. Right, right, right. But you can watch the whole thing. YouTube people. Okay. That's right. all I have. I have just a comment yeah, real quick, and that is getting back to this bibliotheca thing. There's a statistic that's kind of burned in my cortex from a long time ago, and that was, you know, in my personal use of ebooks and checking them out and so on, I always thought that our library had a pretty paltry selection compared to other people. And looking at Pasadena's collection, they had something like 70,000, and LA City Library had like a quarter million titles that you could get. So this is a huge step forward, you know, the library, for me personally, yep. it'll be fun to browse all those titles. So that's, that's really good news. Yeah, I agree. I do. Um, I just wanted to highlight, since, since you didn't, the thing about the credit union. Oh, uh, that, I just think, is such a great example for those of you who might not be reading the minutes. People who join the Friends can now join the Pasadena Federal Credit Union. That is such a... a perfect example of partnership, community partnership, and what a great thing for the friends to be able to use as promotion and, and membership drive. And they're willing material. to come and, and, and give a lectures on finance and stuff. Fantastic. I, just, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I belong to School's First Federal Credit Union, which I'm able to do as a school employee, and back during the, during the Occupy movement, I thought, man, I'm going to occupy Wells Fargo and just ditch them and join the credit union and it's been it's such a boon it's a really really great way to to have your finances so i'm just i'm just so thrilled that that's going to be available to our friends members and i hope that that brings us some new friends members so thank you for whoever thought of that that's all. nicole i guess is that you? oh no the friends started it the I friends just, started it yeah. way to go friends thank you i think it was katie's well, so actually, it's an even better partnership um, because originally it was a suggestion by um, Veronica Jones from the town council. She said, uh, you guys really should think about this. Pasadena Libraries have this set up with um, PFCU. And so we kind of connected the dots and got the friends and the, the staff connected. But yeah, it was, it was a great idea from Veronica. Um, so she deserves all the credit on that one, I think. But yeah, it's very cool. Mm -hmm. And we're oh. also doing it with staff. Nicole met with Howard, and we're going. There, we're going to develop a partnership so that all of the Altadena Library District staff will be able to join as well. Fantastic. They're going to come to I think our January meeting to sign everybody up that wants to become a member. Excellent. Can I do it this right away? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I just wanted to call out as well. Thank you so much for following up on the question we had last month about collections. Um, I was, I really appreciated you guys looking into that, um, and I'm happy that that's not going to be a thing we do anymore. Yep. You're yeah. welcome. Okay, anything else uh, before we move on? Okay, great. So I think that brings us to uh, Christopher. Is that your, your moment? <laughs> S2, the latest and greatest uh, meeting collaboration technology from Microsoft. This was uh, possible because the meeting in the community and also uh, meeting internally too. This lives in our small meeting room and when uh, patrons check out the small meeting room kit, uh, that kit uh, has the option to come with the camera that's uh, plugged in up here on top 
the USB C port, and also this pencil here. Uh, it's electronic pencil to uh, work with the whiteboard portion of the uh, Surface Hub S2. So uh, I've already warned you with staff. I'm just going to um, jump into the session because it's already live. Uh, you can see I've got our statistics sheet up on here, which we were talking about earlier. And um, so when a patron logs in, they can log in with their Microsoft account uh, when, uh, and do things on here. Or if they don't have an account, they can just uh, sign in neutrally and still use some of the uh, applications. And then when they log out, everything is washed out. So uh, it's a nice uh, guest type access for this device. Uh, I pulled up this sheet uh, just to show the board the, uh, the way it looks. And if I click on statistics here, what you're looking at is the retool statistics sheet that, um, that we modeled after the IMLS report that happens every year. Um, you can see you know, responsibility, who's responsible for inputting what data. And then you know, the different categories of data that's from the IMLS. We gleaned out some portions of this uh, to provide the board uh, what we thought were relevant, relevant statistics for your board packet. There's some small changes that I overheard that you'd like to see, so uh, we can get those, get those done. But just an example of like looking at this, let's suppose that you were someone using this and wanted to look at like the, uh, the main visitors graph here and I would change this type to uh, a 2D graph and then add maybe a trend line to it, linear, and you can see, you know, it, so you can do these things on the fly and kind of facilitate meetings and demonstrate things. And um, simultaneously, you could also have, um, so you could also have a session going with like Skype and I'll contact my cohort here, Jonathan, and make a little call with him. Invite him to the session. And I could invite him to the session and then uh, share the whiteboard document to him. Except there. So if I go to whiteboard now, um, I can see this whiteboard here. And I could share this with Jonathan. And then as I'm editing it, he can see everything I'm doing here. So I could say maybe like, hello. right? And that doesn't look very beautiful because my handwriting is terrible. So I can select that and then beautify. There. <laughs> I grab it again, move it up here, turn it sideways, expand. Jonathan, you can see that? You can't see it right now oh. unless I actually, <laughs> unless I go over here and uh, I share this to him. Uh, and then okay. he can open it on his end and see everything that I'm making uh, as far as changes on the fly. All right, Jonathan, I'm going to hang up because of the echo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is basically a meeting, a, a tool to facilitate meetings. It's really nice in that way. Uh, and you can also cast your device to it. So, if I want to connect and just project my computer over to the Surface Hub, I can do that as well. And you can see some other stuff going on here. Yeah, so you can have all this going on at the same time. It's a wonderful uh, addition uh, and tool available for the community now. And once again, thank you to the Pasadena Community Foundation. So question, Christopher. So because it's Microsoft-based, uh, like let's say somebody in the community, you know, is a remote worker, right? That you know, co-workers all over the country and they're doing some kind of project and they're 
using like Microsoft Teams to do all their communication and editing and stuff. So they could essentially reserve the conference room, come in and use that for like the one hour like work meeting. And that would get and because they're logging in through their own Microsoft account, they have access to their files on, on in the cloud and all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so maybe this is super cool. I guess I have a couple of questions. One, are we gonna have um, like training available? Because this seems like the sort of thing that it might be helpful to give people a little bit of a clue to how to use. Um, and second of all, I wonder if there's a, an opportunity to reach out like to the chamber and talk to them about like you know how to do the library tools for small businesses or you know nonprofits. Maybe Jericho Road would be interested. Because it seems like the kind of thing that could be really useful, but that also people wouldn't know we had or what it was or what it was capable of. Yeah, I think uh, yeah that communication line could be open. We can talk to the marketing and engagement coordinator about that. Um, the uh, I'm sorry. What was the first part of that question? Oh, just an on training or on. Oh yeah, so training. Know what to do. Yeah, so. I'm thinking I'm going to see if I can put a tile in here that pretty much just gives a, an overview of, of how to do things. Like you better be available. Yeah. yeah, or even if there's just like, I don't know, like a link on the website or like business tools or something where you can click on and people can find out like, oh, you can check out a mobile hotspot, you can do this thing, you can yeah. do a bunch of stuff. Because I think we have a lot of tools for businesses that people have no idea they have. Right. And I wouldn't want to create our own training video because it would be essentially reinventing the wheel. Right. There's a lot out there on YouTube already. Uh, and so, yeah, we could provide a link to some of those existing videos that Microsoft has already uh, created to promote their product. I have a question. How much uh, capacity is there in the small meeting room schedule to expand to to the to demand that this might bring. Like, is there a lot of space on the calendar for people to reserve that room? I don't, I don't yeah, I mean, right now that room is available on a daily basis, so we don't do advanced reservations. Um, it's available on a walk-in basis, and it's not full all the time. I mean, we definitely get. Um, there are times where you know people. Are reserving it we do reserve it for um, certain like town council committees or literacy tutors those are really the only exceptions to, to, to the scheduling the, ahead of time. right yeah because if people are scheduled if people are trying to use that room for a meeting of a number of people they're gonna need some leeway they're not gonna be able to do that right on a lawful basis so I guess I'm suggesting maybe some review of Reservation policy for that room. It, it was used to good effect the other night or the other day at the uh, facilities committee meeting. And, and Liz got on it and was able to present some of her drawings of concepts for work around here. So we could see it in action. It, it just looks like a very powerful device. And then a question I have for you, Christopher, is that you talked about the trend lines and all these things that you can add to the, to the data on there, right? And so do I understand you, Nikki, that that's the kind of package that maybe we can receive going forward? Would be like an electronic version of this virtual beta so that maybe before the board meeting we can take a look at it? Is that what you had in mind for that? I guess I don't understand. Well, if I was reading those, the, the stats that you had there, they were the same that were in the, mm -hmm. the package here. Yeah. But the difference is you were adding trend lines to it there at one point, right? Did I have that right? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, in order to do that, I had to the chart to 2D, and then I could add a trend line. Okay, gotcha. I was just kind of demonstrating, changing things on the fly. Okay. Uh, I guess where I was going with that is, is there an opportunity for us to take a look at that electronically, that data, and do our own manipulation with it? And so, and maybe that's just me talking because I'm kind of a numbers nerd, but uh, you know, just something to keep in mind. I don't have to have that, but just a suggestion. We could send the yeah, like things. Yeah, if you'd want them in a manipulative. Yeah, or like a little electronic format. Okay. Sure. Yeah, we can send the file. Okay. And then we can 
I guess that was my core question. So. Okay. All right, is there any further questions on this wonderful device? Um, I think it's very cool. Can we see our friends using it? Oh, yeah. Um, That's possible. Um, I'm not trying to mess Does it have a USB? Um, yeah, it does. Plug-in? It has a USB. Yeah, we're on there. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right, so that brings us to item four, payroll schedule. Did you have additional things you wanted to say about the payroll schedule, or are we pretty much all good? Okay. All right, then we are on to 6C, financial reports. These are the financial reports for October of 2019, and it was kind of a quiet month for us. October usually is. Um, so not a lot to report for revenue or for expenditures. Um, there is still showing a balance in the income account for Library Foundation. That's still residual piece of Dina revenue. I'm hoping that um, those last couple silent auction items will be picked up so that I can reimburse them at least before year's end. Um, there is a note that the audit is scheduled for this week. They're supposed to come on Wednesday, so I'm very excited to so get that moving forward. And then they'll present at January's if all goes according to plan. Um, and we'll also be discussing, I didn't make a note about this, um, I think Terry's going to talk about it, discussing mid-year uh, next month, which I'm also looking forward to. Are there any questions about any of the reports? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, we talked about the, uh, the transfer of some of our funds to a more of an interest-bearing account, and, and we approved that a while back. Is that reflected in some of these accounts. I noticed that it seems like you draw down, I'm looking at the balance sheet right now, which is page 46. Um, and if you look at uh, line 20, or 1021, item 1021, that seems to be the drawdown account that you have when we're waiting for tax revenues to get right and we're trying to fund things. Is that how that goes? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so that that's, we're still, I still have the bulk of our funds with Chase Bank. Okay. I guess my core question was, do we expect these things to shuffle around a little bit in the next few weeks or months as, as this money starts to hit different, more interesting accounts and so on? Yes, okay. so I'm, I'm slowly transferring our funds from Chase to Pacific Western, and then once all the funds have been moved to Pacific Western and we have closed the Chase account, then we can start transferring it from the county to Lake. Okay, gotcha. And that's when that interest will start to accrue. So there's several weeks away, that it sounds like. Yes, okay, it's a little gotcha. further out. Because I noticed that it's the same, you know, accounts as it's always been. I just wondered what the, what the progress was. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. That was it. Okay. Um, and I'm sure this we've gone through this before, but just so I'm looking at stuff correctly. On the budget versus actual, the, all the numbers listed on their budget are complete budgets here, right? It's not just the six month period, like the July through October. So like I'm looking at like um, pages, what is this, 41 through 45, the profit and loss budget versus actual. Yes, so the budget figure is for the entire fiscal year. Okay. Um, so then, just had an idea that's probably irregular. Would it be possible on every month's report to add the percentage of the year that has gone by? Yeah. I mean, that just makes it a lot easier for your eye to roll down the numbers and know that, you know, 28% of the year has gone by and 28% of the budget has been spent, you know? You know no, what I mean? So, I'm, I, so July, August, September, October, four twelfths of the year have gone yeah. by. That number's in my head. I didn't think to yeah, it, before, it would, so I that, that would be a nice little addition. Definitely. Thank you. The, the way I tend to look at this would be, you know, if you look at July through October, is basically a third of the year. Yes. And if you look on the percentage of budget down the far right column, stuff that, you know, we expect to be 33% through our budget for the year. And, so the ones I look at are the ones that jump out, like we've got one, for instance, on page 44, where we've got uh, small equipment. We've already, that's going to be line number uh, 
67.55, and we've already spent 62% of that particular budget. So there are these rhythms that I know I'm still getting used to, especially about when you pay for pensions and things like that, where suddenly there's a lot of the budget for the year is gone, but it's because it was a big bolus payment that occurred, you know, up front, basically. Yes. Yeah. So I, I do have the 33% figure in my head, but it, it didn't occur to me that other people would, and I'm so sorry. So, put that in. so what percentage is 5 twelfths? Quick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, see me neither. But we'll need to know next month. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a couple of questions about, uh, and maybe we'll talk about this more when we get to some of the items that impact it. So just the structures and improvements, uh, 7320 line item, because I know that we're going to be talking a little bit later on about potentially reallocating some of these in there. So I guess my big overall question for this moment is that 8% um, doesn't reflect those projected changes, correct? No, 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 it doesn't. Right. And so what other, besides the stuff that we're talking about tonight, um, what other expenditures are projected for that $79,500? That were originally projected? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question for Jonathan if he's still around. I know there were items in there, he's right behind you. Um, like a new roof that I don't know that we're going to be able to we were going to take, we were looking at it. One of the issues is we're bringing up today an RFP for the air conditioning system. Right. We already put up some of the ladders that are being in the metro part of what we've done already. We were looking into some of the um, uh, lighting situations where we were going to do some safety lighting. Uh, we did a safety tour last week and we showed some of the safety products that we wanted to do. There's some we that we want to do, but um, because of ARG and what we want to do, That brings us to committee reports. Um, so let's start with uh, the budget committee. <laughs> so we're just saying, and while Nicole's here, she can help me with this. We want to have a budget committee meeting on the uh, the third week or thereabouts of January. So we still haven't set a date, but there will be an agenda that's made. You know, a real basic one. It will be posted because it's not an ad hoc committee. And what I'd like to do with that meeting would be to talk about the very item you just brought up, Katie, and that is, okay, you know, we're, we're getting into other pockets of money to pay for things that are changing, as, you know, as always happens. But we'll know, we, I hope, a little bit more about what the pathway is going to be for facilities as well. Maybe some some uh, costs are starting to gel and so far, or, or, and so on. But so far, that really hasn't happened. We're still in the process of it. So the third week, uh, and Betsy's on the committee as well, so we'll, uh, we'll get a time that's convenient to everybody and get that one going. Okay, terrific. Um, facilities. So uh, folks can see there's two action items on the agenda for later tonight, so I won't get into um, those two issues now. Um, but the, the two other things I want to just report is, so the uh, ad hoc committee had our second uh, official meeting with ARG. Um, basically did an initial review of some rough uh, design plans and sketches uh, that ARG had put together uh, after receiving the community feedback from our two town halls that we've done so far. Um, what I would say on that is the initial uh, kind of design work that we saw was pretty exciting, uh, to say the least, uh, for both, both the main and the branch library. Um, I know we've provided some feedback, so they're making some adjustments to those uh, before our next round of public meetings um, to get additional public input. Uh, now that there will actually be a couple of proposed options um, that will be presented that folks can actually rea you know, react to and, and give additional feedback. So those two meetings are set for the second week of January. Um, so obviously, uh, we hope to get a little bit further ahead of the outreach than we were last time. Um, so folks, keep an eye out. Uh, you know, we'll be doing emails and all that good stuff with those two dates. And again, there will be one at Bob Lucas uh, and one at Maine. Um, the presentations will include 
uh, both uh, the main and branch. But again, uh, just like last time, we want to be able to provide the time and space uh, to focus on each, each uh, library um, at those meetings so that folks don't have to attend both if they don't have time to do so. Um, so that's it as far as the verbal report, and then we've got the action items later. And I'm sorry, did you say you, you had dates for those, or you didn't? Yeah, for so the second week of January? We're, remind me, so we're doing Bob Lucas on Monday the 6th? Monday the 13th. 13th. January 13th at 6.30. And then Thursday, January 16th, we'll be here at May at 6.30 also. Okay. So Monday the 13th and Thursday the 16th. And we'll start getting some flyers out now about that. month for us. Um, I am very excited to present to you guys in your packet, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at it, the um, final draft of the executive summary for our strategic vision and framework. So this is going to be on pages um, 49 and following. And um, as, as I said to you guys last month, what this basically represents is the <coughs> highest level summary of the strategic planning conversations that we've had. There are two additional documents that are not included in your packet this month because they're still getting sort of some finishing touches put on them, and that is the long form um, kind of in-depth process document that you saw a version of, I believe, two months ago, as well as a document that includes all of the data and analytics that went into supporting all the conclusions that we so those will hopefully be included in the board packet for January. Um, I can't imagine why they wouldn't be, but this is, this is the sort of document that would be our most public-facing version that would be out in the community that people would have um, a chance to get their hands on as quickly as possible that hopefully staff can use to help kind of guide some of the conversations that are going to go forward. And I would say that in addition to all the hard work that the Strategic Planning Committee has, has put in, um, that there is a huge debt that uh, is owed to Chloe and Timothy for all of their hard work getting this over the finish line because it was a big effort and uh, we absolutely could not have done it without some of Chloe's input. So, thank you so and much. Katie's long, long <laughs> hours of helping us with it. Well, thank you. Um, so, I would say that the recommended action um, is that you. Um, approve and adopt this strategic framework. But in the meantime, I'd love to answer any questions or, or talk more about any parts of this that you guys would like to talk about. Yeah, and just a quick question for me, maybe you said it, but is this something that would go on, on the library website then Absolutely. that people can access it and yep. so on? Okay. Yeah, we'll have it in print, we'll have it online, we'll have it in physical format, so kind of in any way you might encounter it. And then the last version of it then will include the statistics and the analytics. And so the those will be separate documents. Okay. So this is like, I think it's like 28 pages, if I recall. So it's, it's a fairly substantial thing in and of itself. Um, and then the long form version and the data will be separate documents that certainly will be publicly available as well on the library website and people can have copies of. But we imagine that, that most folks may not want, you know, a big stack of data. Right. Yeah. But that it's certainly available. So I guess what I'm, I'm trying to determine is if this is the framework right. for it, but what might exist as sort of a permanent document is going to be look a little different than this. Is that right, or is this um, the face of it, and it this will is, be? Yeah, this is forward. this is the face of it, right? And then what Nikki and everybody on staff will do would be to come back with an implementation plan mm -hmm. that will say, okay, here's what we're going to do in the next 12 months okay. that deal with, you know this particular strategic priority and here's how we're going to achieve this particular idea. So yeah, this is this is the framework and so the filling in will be what the implementation plan does. And then I imagine the board will give little updates about how the strategic mm -hmm. plan is being executed. So yeah. okay, good. I got it. Yeah, we're um, 
we shared this draft with the staff in my weekly update that I sent out last week so that they could take a look at it before it's approved. Um, and then I met with the management team two weeks ago and they've been tasked to work with their departments to put together goals and objectives that are gonna support specifically the three strategic priorities. So we'll be able to present uh, clear goals and objectives for each department in January is my hope. Okay, great. And I think I think the idea too is that you know this is a this is obviously a, a major investment on the part of the district. We spent a lot of time and energy and money developing a strategic framework, and so that it's not a one year thing. Mm -hmm. This can be our strategic framework for the next you know three to five years. The way that we articulate each of those things will change over time. Certainly, as we get we get better and more sophisticated at each of them, but that this can exist as a sort of general roadmap. Right. I'm not going to say North Star because it drives Granny up the wall. So, we'll, so we'll I'm just a bit later, yeah. just yeah. to be clear, the the so the priorities are are curious connectors, neighbors. Those are the priorities yes. that were yes. that. And as and are you asking us to to officially approve? So we've got, yeah, we've got an item a little bit later on. Um, yeah, um, it's um, 8, 8B. So that's, the committee's just gonna recommend got that it. that's what, okay. what you do, but yeah, we'll have that official action later on. Um, and it, normally I would say at the conclusion of that vote, should it be an affirmative one, we would dissolve the committee, but since we still have those two outstanding um, documents in development, I would say we'll probably wait until January to dissolve it. Well, I think this document itself is terrific, and I like the way that the pictures really tend to humanize what's going on at the library, yeah. which is really nice. There's some good shots in here. Well, and again, a big thank you to Chloe for all yeah. of her hard work on that and putting, exactly. it, putting it face on. Okay, um, so that's it for strategic planning. Um, I will admit that I did nothing on the California Voting Rights Act Committee, so I have no report to make. Um, but I do want to make sure we put some time on the books um, in the next month or two to talk about census and how we can interact with that. Okay, um, 6E, trustee reports. That's it. Um, I don't have a formal report, but I just would like to share <coughs> this title that the disaster survival, survival Bible that was um, recommended at the disaster workshop that I went to at CLA, and we, we already owned it. I was really glad about that. Um, and I know that um, Helen is an emergency, um, I forget what her title is, but like emergency committee person or whatever. Anyway, I'd love to share this with her. This was something that was recommended that um, I don't know if it's available in an ebook version, but one of the ideas from that workshop was to have a cloud library of, of disaster related or preparedness, let's put it that way, um, materials that, um, that patrons could access virtually. So uh, I, just, I just picked this up off the whole shelf, so I'm curious to dip into it, and I think it's going to be a good resource for our own preparedness as well as for our patrons. Uh, uh, it's only been like three weeks or so since we're our last <laughs> meeting, but there's, uh, I think there's a lot been going on. The Christmas tree lighting was terrific. Uh, everybody did a great job speaking in front of the crowd. And there weren't as many people, I believe, here this year, um, what you thought, Jason, but there weren't as many people, I think, on the streets this year as there were in last year, I thought. Mm. Yeah, did, were you guys there as well? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so that was really a lot of fun, and uh, what lives on in our household was that little choir they had for the two schools that were together. That was just amazing. Another thing that happened uh, of interest to me was uh, Jonathan had a safety tour that we did a few days ago, and that was really an eye-opener in terms of just knowing where all the fire extinguishers are, getting a real good look at the roof and so on. Um, there's a lot to do, obviously, and uh, it was fun to get into the infrastructure a little bit in that regard. So that's all, of it, all, all I have to say about it. 
And then just on that note, because it kind of, we, for the sake of time, skipped over it, but I did see in, in, in the director's report that we're reinstituting the staff safety committee, so I think it's timely that we did the walkthrough. Yeah. Which I missed, but. And you missed out, because we went on the roof. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I keep like, missing my opportunity I told the staff. to climb up on the roof. Yeah, I was like, if you can't find me, did you use the new ship ladder? I, I did, mm -hmm. in heels. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wrong. Yeah. That was impressive. I respect that. Firemen will have no trouble. <laughs> no, it's nice. Okay, so that brings us to item seven. It's been about an hour and a half. How's everybody doing? Do we need a short break? You want to go boldly forward? No, keep going. What? Great. All right. Well, it's everybody's favorite time in the agenda, and I believe this may be our last, our last one. Um, we may bring it back. You know, we miss it. But why not? <laughs> and then take it away. <laughs> this is a terrible. Oh, I don't have any presenter notes because I didn't uh, have it together. It was a stressful week. I was thinking last week it was thrown together very quickly. Um, this was from the CSDA conference, which last month was also pulled from. Um, but this one talks about agenda requirements. So, so we all know the 72-hour posting, um, a description of each item of business. So this is pulled from the code. It says generally not, need not exceed 20 words. They mentioned something about that, um, that it should just be a very brief description. Um, some items obviously are a little longer than others, um, but it should inform the public of the scope of the body's intended plans so that people can decide whether or not they want to attend. Um, and then alternate formats, um, public comment period, and then web posting requirements. So um, it has to be on the very front page. That was a new law that started this year. There has to be a button right on the front home page of the website that um, takes you to the agenda, which we do have. Thanks to Chloe. Um, so these are just accept exceptions to items um, that don't have to be on the agenda. Um, you can see those there. So they did um, talk about a case that was Transparent Gov Novato versus the City of Novato. Um, in which the city council, they cited the city council of Nevada created a subcommittee without agendizing that specific action and held substantive uh, discussions on aspects of two projects. So what happened was there was this like bus stop or something <laughs> that um, came up and the city council members started talking about it and got into a lengthy discussion and that was that project was never on the agenda um, and also then created their they said oh well let's create a subcommittee for this item which was not on the agenda so um, they were sued by this transparent gov um, and so they the trial court ruled in the city's favor because what happened was the um, the city did basically a resolution, which we're familiar <laughs> with, saying, we're sorry, we're not going to do that again, and, you know, it was a mistake. <laughs> um, and so, and you know, <laughs> so basically the Court of Appeal affirmed, and they said that because the city remedied the action and there was no, you know, they believed that they weren't gonna violate that again, uh, violate the Brown Act again in that way, that 
you know, there, there was really no case for this agency or organization that was suing them. Um, but I don't think we're going to have that problem here. <laughs> we have a subcommittee actually on the agenda tonight. Um, and yeah, we've been pretty good actually about agendizing all of our items and, you know, meeting with the president and the director and making sure that we have the agenda solid. So that's it. And congratulations, you guys. You guys did your 12 months. Yeah. 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 And thank you, Kaylin, for every month having yeah. the content on the Brown Act. Twelve months of content on that is not well, an easy I task. I was actually learning stuff right up to the end, like some of the things oh, you said tonight. Okay. So that was a good job. Thanks a lot. All right, seven um, B. So this is just an update. Um, I told you guys last month that there was an ongoing discussion about Franklin Elementary and um, the situation there. So. I guess it was after our last meeting, um, there was a kind of a community conference call, which Terry, you were on, um, so thank you for that. And the, the discussion was basically um, to try to figure out what there was momentum in the community to do, right? Whether people wanted to picket the PUSD board or try to come up with some sort of alternate agenda or what, and um, the consensus seemed to be in that discussion and the, and the aftermath of it that really the focus should be on figuring out how to make sure that families and kids affected by the Franklin closure are getting the support and the assistance and the attention that they need, that they are actually being put into neighborhood schools that are really in their neighborhood, if that's what they want, and that um, there be a good focus on a conversation with the community about what the future of that campus looks like. Um, and I think as a neighbor of, of Franklin Elementary, that's a conversation that we would be interested in as well. So the latest on this is that um, the town council is discussing whether or not they want to draft a letter to PUSD basically saying, these are our concerns. We want to make sure that you know kids and families are taken care of, that there's good conversation with the community. Um, and that there's a open discussion about the future of that campus. Um, and, you know, there's been some back and forth about whether that should come from the town council exclusively or any other group, but at this point, I don't think there's any action for us to take. I just wanted to keep everybody in the loop, um, and I'll be happy to continue doing that if that's something you guys want to know about, or not if you don't. No, I mean, I I just feel like um, as soon as the community that's impacted um, decides to take any kind of formal action, my personal recommendation is, would be to this board, at minimum, do something formally on the record in support of those folks. Yeah. And so, yeah, so keeping us informed, I think, is a, is a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I think with sort of the ongoing discussion about like what is the town council's sphere of influence and they have an education committee and they have sort of some jurisdiction is the wrong word, but like it's their sphere of interest and influence. So I think letting them take the lead on any kind of formal action is smart, but I think that if there is an opportunity to be supportive of, of something that might be wise to entertain at that point. I went and back and looked at the meeting where this all transpired the vote, which was in September. And Franklin had a pretty robust in-person response to that. They yeah. had all of their, not all of them, but they had quite a few parents and kids, as did the other schools. But it really felt to me like the bus had sort of left the station as soon as they did the vote. So yeah. it's done. The, uh, the spaces have been cleared for them to go to the next school and so on. And as, as much as I felt sorry for them sort of 
being uprooted in a way and having to go to a new, a new school and everything else, it did seem to me as if all those kids are gonna land on their, their feet because of the priority they get for registration for that school. That's what I, I might have gotten it wrong. So even though there was this bump in the road for all the families in terms of location and had taken their kids to that school because it's a neighborhood school and so on, I did feel that PUSD had thought it through. This is really an economic decision for them and made sure that there was a place for them to, to sort of land. So I, I was of the opinion that after I watched this that there probably needs to be sort of a cooling off period because like it's going to happen. Everybody oh, right, is, yeah. you know, is already already going to exactly. go. And I started to started to think about what are some of the things that we as a library might be able to do to help in the situation. And one idea, probably naive, but I'll throw it out there was is you know do we or could we have uh, a station at um, the uh, Bob Lucas Branch, because a lot of the kids are from that neighborhood, in which we make sure that we have every textbook that these kids are gonna need for the upcoming semester. So that if somebody loses a book, or they couldn't get to school to study, or whatever, they, they would know, the families in that neighborhood, that we've got a complete set of what they have to have to, to carry out their schoolwork. And you could take that as far as you wanted, us as a library, in terms of having a a section for you know high school books, even PCC kids lose books there, you know, and, and their bookstores packed with stuff. Uh, one of those each would be good. But I was just, I, and I know this is way outside the box, but things like that were coming to me rather than, you know, getting up and PUSD's grill again about this because they've already they've thought this through. I thought, and they they had to make that particular decision, and you know the whole program has been launched. So I had that feeling. I felt sorry for them, but I also felt like rather than get involved with any kind of a letter or intercession as a library, uh, even if it is with the town council, if that's what you might have been suggesting, uh, I, I thought that might be something that we, uh, I don't know, it didn't seem like the right idea. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the level in which we engage this um, <coughs> needs to be one where we bring an idea to them, could you use this? rather than well, could you rethink it and maybe reverse your decision or something, because that's really the only way out for, for them. Right, and I mean, I think, I think there's, there's no question that they're gonna, that's not gonna happen, right? Like, you're right, that, that ship has sailed, they're not reversing their decision, they're not gonna change their minds. I think the, um, <clears throat> the concern, I think, is that, you know, in the past, Northwest for PUSD and West Altadena for us has typically been an area where provision of service has not been um, available to the same level and provided with the same equity that it is in other parts of town. And I think for a lot of people, and I'm not trying to speak for them, but this is just what I've heard is that Franklin's closure feels like the latest in a long line of, 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 West Altadena getting the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, you know, one of our conversations we have as a board all the time is how can we do a better job with the branch, how can we do a better job providing, you know, equitable service across our entire district. And I, I, I guess I just wonder if there is an opportunity here for us to do something real. And I think that you're, you're absolutely right. Like, we should bring an idea to the table, right? I, we shouldn't just shout at people and say, you are terrible running your school district, but if, there, if there's a way that we can actually help and provide services or resources or something um, for a part of town that we know we haven't always served as well as we could, and that certainly PUSD, I think, has not always served as well as they could, I think it's worth thinking thinking critically about that. And, I agree. and I'll also say uh, there's no way that the current PUSD board is going to change course. Um, but just like many other situations, including, frankly, the ones that brought some of us onto this board, these kinds of things provide opportunities. And, you know, uh, you're already seeing a new crop of folks step up to run for the board in 2020. Yeah, that's so um, there's an opportunity there, potentially. I mean, I don't know who or how many, but 
you know, um, there'll be an opportunity there to potentially change that board. You know, only time will tell um, if that'll lead to any change. They just need a one vote swing on that yeah. vote that they took. Yeah, one vote right. either way would have done. So. That's right. Well, and I, and I think, you know, as we look at partnerships with other institutions, certainly we have a vested interest in developing a good partnership with PUSD. And so figuring out maybe how to use this as an opportunity to do that. And I think you're absolutely right, like being combative and saying you guys are, are terrible people is not always the way to gain consensus and get people to work with you. Um, but if there is a way to do something substantive that makes the situation better, I think it would be a, a great a great chance for us to bring something to the table. Do we have to comment after all the items are done? Do you, no? So I guess I'll, if you guys want to keep this on as a as an ongoing like kind of public service announcement, we can bring it back next month. Um, if there's something new to report, otherwise, not so much. Yeah, I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. Actually. Okay. And if we think of it that way, I guess you know, some good ideas might come out of this. Let's move on to 8A, the creation and ad hoc subcommittee, uh, excuse me, an ad hoc committee for district director evaluation process. Um, Betsy, I'm guessing. Yeah, I is, can speak to that. Do you want to that. speak to this? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, you might remember from the last a little while that, that we've kind of been in an ongoing kind of work session among Nikki and Terry and myself about the Eval Nikki's evaluation for the first year, and as we really got down to the to the rubber of the road this last month, we realized with the human resources uh, audit or you know consulting that's coming up, it, it we were concerned that we would put a lot of work into a, an evaluation process that might then be changed or, or altered through that process. And so, um, and as Terry pointed out, it's been, we've just kind of taken this on sort of as, a, as an after effect of having been the search committee, that it uh, just made more sense to, to formalize what we need to do um, with the creation of an, of an actual ad hoc committee for this purpose and um, to, to uh, have that committee take on the, the actual official process of um, working with Nikki on evaluation format for the three and the six month evaluations that we have um, decided among ourselves that we want to do. And then if desired, and, you know, and this I think could be Nikki's call, if it would help to also have this committee um, uh, assist in any way that it might help to um, work with the, with the HR um, consulting that's going to happen over the next couple of months. So with that, um, that's what our suggested action item is that is that a subcommittee be actually formally created rather than being as ad hoc as we have been. <laughs> I don't care if you want to add anything to that. That's kind of no, it, that, that's exactly right. I just felt like we were, you know, the rogue element <laughs> of Bessie and I a little bit. And this all comes from the very good idea that Bessie had early on, and I think it will help Nikki too, just, you know, establish a framework right away. Because the point she made was that a lot of times, you know, you hire somebody and you dust your hands off and you go your separate ways, uh, but we really need to, you know, and, 
fairness to, to staff, make sure that Nikki's got the review materials that she needs. So I think it, uh, it would make me feel a lot better to be working on, on something like this if I was going to be part of the committee that, um, <laughs> that had the official sanction of the board. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, and I think that carrying over some of the expertise mm -hmm. and, and conversations that you guys have had as part of the search committee makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I was just checking the policies. You'd think I would remember how it works, but I didn't. Um, so this would be an ad hoc committee, so a temporary advisory committee, um, which is limited to less than a quorum. So two people, so I'm presuming Betsy and Terry. Um, specific charge would be to, what precisely? Um, I said it so well in an email, but um, <laughs> it would be to, um, to work with Nikki to create a format for the evaluation that will be done in the, at the February and at the May meetings and to coordinate with the HR consulting group to finalize a permanent, or for now anyway, a, an ongoing evaluation tool to use with the, for the director position on, on an ongoing basis. So for us to, to create something to use in the meantime and then work with them on whatever ends up being the, the ongoing document. And, and in the meantime, while we're working all this out, that um, Nikki will continue to use kind of we, kind of the laundry list that we talked about at last meeting of the, of um, priorities that she has set for herself for for the first three months that she's already probably mostly done with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the idea is that the committee would bring a recommendation on those criteria back to the full board, and we right. talk about it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, um, then uh, any other, let me, we'll just get the motion mm -hmm. figured out and then we can talk about it more. Um, so then can I have a motion to um, create and authorize an ad hoc committee composed of Betsy and Terry to develop, refine, and establish evaluation criteria for the district director in concert with the director and to liaise with the HR audit um, on an ongoing basis until such time as those criteria should be approved by the full board. Um, before, well, I guess maybe we second and do let's, all yeah, that. Yeah, if that, that, that seems basically a, right, <laughs> then let's, maybe if I can get that motion in a second, then we can talk about membership or if we want to do it differently or whatever. I'll, I'll move that motion. I guess I'll, I'll second that. Okay. So when do you have to I, I'm, I'm not sure if you, you can just appoint us. Too. I can that's just appoint you. Yeah. yeah. Well, Page I know. I, it, that's part of why I wanted to yeah, take I a look at so Violet. I mean, you have the power to just create this. You just, you, so you don't really need it. Much authority. <laughs> All right. Well, then. Maybe to create yeah. it by the president at, at any time. At any time. At any time. Okay. Well, then forget all that junk I said about the motion. And I hereby, by the power vested mm -hmm. in me, <laughs> by switching seats with Terry. Devil. Yeah, by the gap. That's right. Um, then, uh, do you guys both want to be on this committee? Yeah? I hear no? by Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so I appoint Betsy and Terry to the ad hoc uh, committee on district director evaluation. Cool. Done. And do you need, you need to name a chair? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to be chair, Betsy? Sure. Do you want to be chair, Terry? It doesn't matter to me. I'd be happy to chair. Okay. okay. Betsy to chair. We don't. We don't need a motion. We don't need. It. I just do it by fiat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. That's it. Ooh. Are you dizzy? I am. <laughs> I'm benefit of updating board policy. I should have read them more thoroughly. Okay. So. Perfect. Um. That brings us to eight B. This one we do actually need a motion for. Um, so this is the review and approval of the strategic plan executive summary. So the motion here would just be to approve and adapt the strategic framework as set forth in the board packet. I move. I still move. Yes. I second. Okay, moved 
15 seconds in discussion or questions. All right, hearing none, we'll proceed to a vote. So all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Awesome. Yay. Just once again with thanks to the Strategic Planning Committee. Here, here. All right, so that brings us to item 8C, um, the review and approval of historical designation eligibility of the main library, and we have a public comment here, so sir, if you'd like to make your comment. Sure. You um, my name is Jim Lamaco. I, uh, I'm so sorry, could I ask you to come over to the, um, yeah, you can just okay, speak into the mic so we get it on the record. Thank yeah, you. my name is Jim Lamaco. Um, I'm a longtime library lover. I, uh, my first job was uh, working at the Thomas Edison Branch Library in Detroit, Michigan, where I grew up. And um, when I went off to University of Michigan, my younger sister took over my job. Now, I, I never worked in a library after that, but my sister made a career out of it. Uh, she retired as the uh, young adult librarian of the state of Virginia. She worked for the state library in Virginia. and. Just to get an example how my sister and I relate to historic buildings and libraries, I was there kayaking on a kayak trip a few years ago and she said, oh, Jim, you're going to be in Matthews. You've got to go to the library in Matthews, a little town in a backwater Chesapeake Bay. Um, so I just stayed in a B&B that night of my two-week kayak trip around Chesapeake Bay. And um, it was an awesome library. I spent the evening there. There's no nightlife in Matthews anyway. But one of the nice things about the um, it was a beautiful library, it's small, but it's big for such a small town, but it was a super comfortable, like this library, super comfortable part of the community. Um, I, uh, I've hung out in a lot of other libraries, and uh, I don't, I don't want to, I could talk for a long time. I was on the, uh, I'm also into historic preservation, I was on the, I live in the Mills Act house, uh, 1921 house. That, you don't know how that works. If you live in a whole house, get it on Mills Act because you got real low taxes and they're transferable to a new buyer. Like my house, 1921 taxes, the Mill Act taxes are about um, $1,800 a year. And if I sell the house, the new buyer, if they elect to stay in the Mills Act, that's all they have to pay. So that's a, anyway. Um, what I want to, and I'm sure you guys are going to vote for this, but what I wanted to point out is. Um, uh, I've hung out in a lot of libraries, like I said. The Boston Library is magnificent. The main library in Detroit where I grew up is, it's, it, it, it could be on the Parthenon. It's white marble, you know, Detroit was known as the uh, Paris of the Midwest because it was the, one of the richest cities in the world, you know, in the beginning of the auto industry. And, uh, but Pasadena is awfully special. We all know the Pasadena Main Library, awesome and historically designated. The, uh, um, the branch libraries are nice. Um, the uh, library at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals over on Grand Avenue, if you haven't been in that library, it's awesome. They have Wi-Fi. You can just go in there and hang out and get a view of the Arroyo, and it's free, and it's good parking. And you can, and you can see arguments they are going to go to the Supreme Court next there. So, you know, it's a fun day. Um, so I think it's totally appropriate for this library to be historically designated my cousin, who also grew up in Detroit with me, was just here last weekend. He lives in Kalamazoo. He's a landscape ar architect, uh, semi-retired. He likes historic homes. He lives in one. I took him up here last Saturday to show him the library. It was closed, um, but uh, we got here late. And um, But I wanted to point this library out. I had no idea that you, know, you were going to consider historic designation. But I wanted to explain to Kenny, because I've also been to the Kalamazoo Library visiting him, I wanted to point out that I think, you know, to, to make him understand and show him what a cool library was up in Altadena. I live in Pasadena, but near Washington, so it's not that far. Just what an awesome library this is that, you know, everything, the design, I mean, yeah, you, some people might say, yeah, it's not historic. Well, William Pereira's buildings are historic, and there's two of them in Pasadena, you know. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful idea, and if in the future there's a uh, sometime when you guys are long gone, 
If there's some trustees that decide they want to mangle this beautiful design, they won't be able to do it. So, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you Jim. All right. So, um, Nikki, do you want to talk about this or Jason? I'll, I'll let Nikki okay. go and then if it, I feel okay. if there's anything that really has to be added, I can do so. Okay. So, um, as was mentioned earlier, we met with ARG last Wednesday, I think. Um, and in working on the design, they, they brought up wanting to use the State Historic Building Code. Um, and to be able to do that, we don't have to have the building officially designated because there were there was some discussion, I would say, amongst the committee about moving, like making that final decision right now. And we didn't know that that's something the board or the library district wants to do. But if we get the building deemed eligible for historic designation, then you're able to use that historic code, as well as apply for grant funds and other things based on that eligibility designation. So um, Katie Horick, who's the principal in charge of the project, and basically like the expert on historical designation of the group, uh, went back on Thursday and, and looked into how much it would cost to do the eligibility process. At the meeting, she thought it was gonna be much lower cost. Originally, the quote we were given for historical designation was seven to 8,000. Um, when she, w she was hoping it would be closer to one to two, maybe we'd just have to get a letter that would deem us eligible. She did reach some people with the county and they would need um, the historic resource assessment report, which she believes is gonna cost about five to $6,000 to put together. Based on that, getting that done, submitting it, she's pretty confident, she's very confident that we would be deemed eligible. That report would then be used for the historic designation process. So it still would put the entire project between seven and 8,000, she believes. Oh. So that five to six would go towards designation process, so it would probably be another one to two. Um, but it, it is our recommendation that um, we get the building deemed eligible, and then if down the road we decide to move into historic designation, we have that report, report prepared. But either way, we're eligible to use the historic code by being deemed eligible. I think the, the main point being, I think, um, I mean, what I took from our last conversation is there's clearly still a, a full commitment by this board to eventually get the designation, mm -hmm. but understanding that best case scenario, we're gonna be in design build phase a year from now, uh, and since we didn't budget for this in this budget year, even if it's just a couple thousand dollars, it allows us to basically get to a situation where we can, whatever is needed to finalize this process later in 2020, we can put that into the budget. But this is kind of the initial first step so that the design work that we're doing over the next few months, and the planning and the budgeting can be based on the assumption that we will have historical status by the time we're actually, you know, digging up dirt. I have a question. I'm trying very hard to remember details from the report we had last month, and I, and I just want to clarify my own understanding. As I recall, and what's confusing me is that the, the entity that we're applying to for this is the county, but the, the, but the code that we're hoping to be building under is the state, state historic building code. And there was a thing last month where there was some reason not to care about the county designation of historical significance or something and to go for the state the state uh, designation instead. Am I remembering that right? Well, the state, you apply through the state for the uh, National Register. So it's just the way that, you know, the route that you go through. And it automatically, if you go through the National Register, you go to state landmark as well. Okay, so the so the fact that we're applying to the county is because just the bureaucratic have, yeah, path we go through. We'd have to go through for, all the for the code stuff. Got it. Okay. Regardless. Okay. 
So it, it's basically going to set it up so that they have that on record so that when we get to the point that we're actually pulling the permits for things. They say, oh, this is what applies to you. Okay. So I guess I had a couple of questions about timeline, and, and I think you answered my question about budget, which is basically this is like an installment plan yes. on the historic designation thing. So in what way, if any, would our eligibility impact the process ARG goes through? How would this impact design choices, building choices? Like, can you give me a little bit more of a sense of, of what that means? Well, for example, if we um, are allowed to use historic code, that impacts how we can how we design the elevator, for example. So they presented a couple options to us last week, one of which would be with the existing elevator that we adapt. Um, and we were only able to do that because of using historic code. If we were not to fall under that category, we'd have to completely um, change it, which we're not sure what we're going to do. And that's, you know, part of what they're going to do for us is figuring out um, what it would look like in terms of using historic code. This is how much it would cost to keep the elevator where it is and adjust it versus building a completely different one right. that is um, not falling under historic code, let's yeah. say. So they just wanted to have the ability to be able to present basically both options to us. Okay. as we move forward. And another example they've given us is with um, energy requirements, right? When you're doing the kind of upgrades we're gonna be doing eventually, uh, there's different standards as far as the minimum standard you need to meet if you have historical status. So what it'll allow ARG to do is to give us options, right? Where basically they can say, look, it's gonna cost you X to go to full-scale modern energy efficiency standards you can choose to do why now that you have historical status and here's the difference and here's the cost and so we can make those informed decisions okay. um, and they can put all that together just knowing that we're committed to this process okay. instead of waiting for us to actually complete everything yeah so it's basically like a resolution of intent but just with the primary yeah. package to it um, and I guess my only other question um, kind of addressed earlier, which is if this gets pulled out of the 7320 line item, does that negatively impact in any way other projected? I mean, is, well, there, is there stuff we're not going to be able to do because we're doing this? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I do know when we sit down to do the mid-year budget and make some adjustments, we'll have a better idea but there's many things that I've talked to with both Jonathan and Christopher that we've kind of put the brakes on this year because we weren't sure what was going to come out of the ARG study. Okay. A perfect example is the emergency lights that he talked about putting downstairs when we did the safety tour last week. It's like pitch black. So obviously we need to install lights in the hallway downstairs especially so that if the power goes out you can actually get around. But if we're going to move the elevator for example do we want to spend all this money putting in lights that we're then going to have to rip out to move the elevator? Right. And yet, you know, so the, Jonathan has put some things in place, but again, that's a project we put on hold. We're looking at um, security cameras. That's another one that if we end up doing this, this semi-large scale renovation, we don't want to spend the money putting these things in that we then, maybe we can repurpose, but I do think there's been um, several things that, we're budgeted for that we're not exploring right now that I think could be delayed into the next budget year if that's what it would need to be considering that it's already halfway through the yeah. year which is crazy okay let me say this yeah any other questions okay well then I guess I would like to ask for a motion to um, approve ARG's proposal to deem the main library eligible for historical designation and to I don't guess we need to authorize the money to do that because we can it's less than ten thousand dollars right can you move that yeah on your own? the money's not the, the money's not issue, the yeah. issue so okay so just a motion to um, approve ARG's proposal so moved I'll second Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Sure. <laughs> Signify by saying aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, so that motion.
I think it's a great interim staff. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just, I just want to point out um, ARG's willingness to work with us on this. Like, I just, I feel like, you know, let's be real. In, in the world of business, there's a lot of companies that probably would have said, yeah, you know, it makes sense. We really need you guys to do this because it affects the work we're going to do. Here's what it's going to cost, knowing that we're kind of stuck with it. Right. And instead, you know, they worked with us. They figured out some adjustments, some different options. So I, I think it just makes every every meeting we have with ARG, I feel better about our decision <laughs> to, yeah. to, to yeah. award them mm -hmm. this work. So. That's really encouraging to hear. Okay, so... Um, 8D, review and approval of proposal for seismic study of the main library. So, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. Okay. Um, again, from our meeting last week, the, for them to continue moving forward on the design process, they very highly encourage us to do the seismic study of the building. Um, they did reach out to Holmes Structures uh, to put together a quote on that. I did ask Liz. McLean, who's um, the project manager for this, why Holmes? Because I thought that might be asked. And she explained that in their original proposal to us that they were listed as a subcontractor that could potentially work with us on this project. Um, and she also let me know that they specialize in seismic studies on historic buildings. So if there's a question of why they were chosen, um, they did put together a proposal that we shared last month, but is again in here, and we're recommending that we move forward with allocating $8,000 to do the seismic study so that they can again build that into whatever they find from the study, um, the design process. Yeah. And again, similar to what Nikki pointed out with the historical stuff and some of the projects that they put on hold, I think this goes to, we want to know if there's anything major we're unaware of before we start hiring architects and engineers and digging stuff up and then finding out we can't do what we wanted to do. Um, you know, I don't wanna, I don't want us to approve a plan that let's say we do decide to put in a new elevator and then find out we can't put it where we were gonna put it. Um, and there's just a whole host of other issues. Um, I do wanna, even though ultimately it doesn't meet our needs for this, I do want to thank Jonathan once again for his detective uh, abilities and, and digging up old uh, plans and whatnot because he did find uh, a soil assessment that a previous board had done when there was a really, really significant uh, plan to expand the library. Um, so it didn't ultimately end up helping us here, but I, again, just pointing out Jonathan's uh, perpetual sleuth work that finds all kinds of great history uh, in all kinds of libraries. And the only comment I would make after having read the document, the proposal, is that we should expect probably more costs from this company. It won't be, uh, you know, in my opinion, this won't be $8,000 and we're done. Uh, some of the things that they don't include in their scope of services are material uh, testing and destructive investigation, so the minute they feel like they have to start digging stuff up and looking under the ground and then poking around that way, we're probably going to get some more costs incurred with that. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be a lot, but I think the board needs to be ready and staff too for the uh, idea that there could be some add-ons to what they want to do. It's not a, it's not a, you know, fully encased job, if you know what I mean. Well, so I guess I have a question. <coughs> On page 88 it says, um, we're proposing to provide our services for a fixed fee of $8,000. So does that mean that there is stuff outside this scope? Yeah, if you look at the top of that page, yeah. you'll see that they're not included in the basic scope of service. Okay. So was there a decision not to include those things to keep the cost down? Or do you know what I mean? Like if those are things we're going to need anyway. Yeah, they would have the basic, you know, inspection. Mm -hmm. And then they would, you know, they might make a recommendation that they got to drill through a wall here or dig up a, a place here, et cetera, to get a closer look at the foundation, as it should be, because they want to do a complete assessment. But I'm just telling you that uh, in my reading of this, we could probably expect, uh, you know, some additional costs. Not a lot, but just be ready for it. And really, the cost isn't really our job. It's not up to us to monitor that. But 
you, we will hear about that going forward is my prediction. But my understanding was also, and I think, I don't know, well, Jonathan stepped out for a second. There's these, these uh, seismic studies, there's different tiers, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think some of that stuff is what would be a standard part of a tier two, which is significantly more expensive. Um, but ARG didn't feel that this building needs a tier two. So and to Terry's point, but I would expect that this contractor is probably gonna recommend some number of things that are not within the scope of a tier one, depending right. on if they actually find any issues, and we'll have to you know, evaluate that if that ends up happening. Which is still gonna be cheaper than finding it out yeah, yes. and then resume. later on. No, just, I totally agree with that. Uh, and it sounds like your confidence in ARG to help us make those decisions will be will be there. So it's yeah. you know they can they can recommend what they want, but ARG is the is the main contractor that can help us decide what to do. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Other questions or discussion on this? Then in that case, I'd ask for a motion to approve the authorization of professional services with home structures to conduct the seismic study. I will because I would like to make that motion first. I'll second that. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye, raising yeah. your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, the motion carried, perfect. Moving on to 8E. The review and approval of an RFP for rooftop unit DDC project. This is on page 99 of your packet. So, Jonathan, are we going to hear from you on this? Perfect. Yes. when we did the uh, facilities assessment. Um, our units were port back in, near end of life, near end of life cycle. Looking at 2024 and 2027, or around those times, maybe a little sooner than that. Because we have extended the life of those units by adding, especially this unit, it was called unit number one, we extend the life of that unit by actually putting, uh, uh, last year I believe we did, put in a uh, compressor, and that compressor mm -hmm. extended the life a little bit longer. So we're, um, we're trying to basically extend the life of our MEP situation that we have here, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. We're trying to extend the lives of our units. And so what we did was we, we've done that. But for the past 20, 30 years, um, to change the air conditioning or change the temperature in the building, you have to go on the roof. And I showed Terry. Um, basically the whole concept. And I'd like to show you a quick video of that. It's there. What's, what's the subfolder? It's the, um, the subfolder is, hold on a second. I had it under, excuse me. Facilities. Ooh, yeah, this is a that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of work, huh? <laughs> Go to the last one, please. I'm threatening you with a video again. So. So regardless of the fact, so what we're trying to do is we are going to, uh, we do have an issue with the unit. So every time we change the, have a change temperature, we have to go up, we used to have to go up through the, um, in Christopher's MDF room, we have to go up through, which is his main room. We have to go up through there, through the hatch, climb up to the roof, go several steps over there. There's no really roof access in a sense, no stairs level. It's really, it's really dangerous. So just get through there, and then you have to crawl under the acoustic sound uh, barrier that goes around there, and 
then you have to change the temperature. And I get calls, Jonathan and Cole, or Jonathan, it's warm, or things like that. And I understand that. But we have to go up there all the time to change that. And we have to adjust it inside the unit itself. And so what we're trying to do here with this DDC project was digital, uh, direct digital controllers. We are trying to bring the controllers from the upstairs unit, bring it down to a web-based system. So I, we could be anywhere in the world, and I can adjust the temperature any location. So if I'm in sunny Hawaii and it's freezing out here, I can adjust it for them. And let's go back and this is what we this is the process we do now. Go 
You know, I mean, to Grady's question, that that's part of the longer term plan with all the facilities and stuff that's right. replacing them all together. But I think best case scenario, we're two years out from that. And by doing the digital controllers, I'm sorry, forgive me. By doing the digital controllers, we're also setting in place an infrastructure. And the infrastructure will be, when we're ready for the new units, we already have it in place. And so we're not basically wasting any money in, in, this, in this effort. We are using it, it's going to be conducive for the new one. And so we're just, we're just building the track work, like this building. You know, the, the building, we may do some interior work and things like that, but the, but the skeleton is still in place. So that, that was going to be my question is, is this system going to be compatible with? Right, it is. So future? whatever it is, is we're, we're, we're going to, it's, we made sure with, it, with whoever we go with that it's going to be sustainable with any future uh, endeavors that we do. Okay. So our infrastructure will be the same. So this is, an, this is, a, this is not something that could be, we pay for it Absolutely. now, we have to pay for it again. And it's I, yeah, and that's something that I, I especially want to be very careful with right. our tax budget dollars and make sure that it's done right. I have a question. Do, do we have any ballpark idea about how much this might cost? Uh, yeah, we have a ballpark. 24. Thousand? Yes. And again, this is in the, this would be coming out of that 7320 yes. line item, right? Where we have, yes. I think, 79. Yeah. Even if we move the, whatever it is, 16, yeah. 18 out of there, we would still have more than enough right. in that budget. Right. And, and if I could go back to something when, when we did this uh, facilities tour, and yes, one of the things that we wanted part of that budget was to do the safety lighting. But since we are doing this ARG project and everything, it would be that's one thing that I can't do right now because if they have any whatever plans we decide on, whatever you know, whatever you know, A B you know, A B whatever they want to do, um, if they're going to do any construction downstairs, it will be a waste of money to do that. Yeah. Right. So that's why we have to table that part. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, um, do you have a sense, and it may be premature because I know you're asking for that in the RFP, but do you have a sense of what the timeline might be on installation? Uh, it what would probably, if uh, had someone already in mind, and the, the sense would be about a, it would be a, a two to five week project. And would that require any closed time? No closure whatsoever. Just noise and a mess. That's basically it. <laughs> what, what they would do, there, the, we did some demolition that needs to be taking place, but the demolition makes mostly take, uh, uh, will be associated upstairs with any of the units, taking some of the, uh, the controllers off and bringing in some electrical work that needs to be done. And the sensors that we have downstairs mm -hmm. will be replaced. And so we will get all, all up to date. Everything would be modern. And, and then another thing, too, we already know that, as Terry saw last week, we do have three units there. And that when that time comes, we can have the other one in there because there's, we just need to work. Right. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 All right. Then could I have a motion to approve the RFP for the rooftop unit project? So moved. I second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, carried unanimously. Less time up on the roof, hopefully. Oh. <laughs> All right, that brings us to item F, review and approval of revised outside employment policy, which is on page 110 of the packet. Nikki, do you want to talk about that? Sure, thanks. Um, so, um, as my report says, this outside employment policy was one that um, Cindy brought in her time here um, and got approved by the board in June of 2019. Um, I met with the staff association about two weeks ago and they brought it up to me as a concern. Um, when I read the policy and looked at the form, which are both included in here, um, it was for all staff. and. Um, I do think it was largely based on the policy that was in Glendale, and that one only applied to part-time staff, which I, or I mean to full-time staff, which I think makes a lot more sense. So I mentioned that to them, that everybody was pleased with that idea that we just add in that this only applies to full-time staff, and that they'll have to fill out paperwork once a year just stating that they have outside employment, or if they're going to explore outside employment, they would have to fill out the form and get that approved. But part-time staff, 
I've seen many of my employees have to work two or three jobs if they're working part time. So um, it's just a minor revision and one that I know that the staff was very supportive of. So hopefully we can vote to uh, approve that. No this is, yeah, this is a no brainer. Yeah, okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the revised policy? So moved. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that brings us to item G, the appointment of liaisons to the Friends Board, the Foundation Board, and our Government Relations Liaison. Um, well, I know this isn't the purview of my, you know, unstoppable executive power to just make appointments. Um, I know that our committee work has shifted somewhat, so I'd just like to get a sense from people, um, kind of maybe speak a little bit for those of us who have been liaisons, what that workload has been like. Um, if you'd like to continue in that position, if you'd like to shift, um, I think it would be nice to have a bit of a consensus if we want to move these around a bit, we can, or keep them the same. That's fine as well. Um, Terry, do you want to start? I know you've been the foundation liaison. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoy being the liaison with the foundation and, uh, of course, got the history and so on. But I am of the mind that we should, you know, mix it up a little bit just to give them new faces to work with and so on. So as I look at this, um, I mean, there's not any burning desire to be one thing or the other, uh, frankly, but I, I do believe that uh, mixing it up would be good for us and good for the, the boards we're sitting on. Yep. Right, there's friends and there's yes. the government liaison. Who else is, who else is on there? There's just, yeah, foundation friends. Government. So Katie had mentioned just to, to speak to what it was like, so I'm presuming it meant basically going to a monthly meeting. Going to a monthly meeting and then well they don't even meet that often anymore oh, okay. they scaled back their meetings to once you know every other month and uh, I didn't make the last one because it was a retreat and I was out of town that weekend so they're they're due to have one coming up but they're uh, they're a good group as you know mm -hmm. uh, they're uh, we're just doing a great job leading things and uh, they're it's just a, a pleasant bunch to be with and they've got good ideas mm -hmm. so I could add that to whoever might be thinking about you know, working with them. And I'm perfectly happy to keep going, don't get me wrong. I just am of the opinion that if we mix it up, it would probably be good for all of us. Yeah. Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about what you've done with the Friends? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Friends aren't very demanding, at least of me. Um, it's, I mean, they have their monthly meeting. Uh, they're pretty, pretty tight in their schedule, about an hour and a half. Um, and I've really just been there just in case you know, they need anything on the board or any kind of immediate communication with us, which they haven't really. I mean, folks, Granny and others, are very good about uh, reaching out and then attending our monthly meetings. So, yeah. Cool. So the government liaison role, um, I feel like it took me a while to sort of figure out what how to approach that and the way I have approached it is to basically keep tabs on uh, stuff on the uh, small district association, special district association um, action email that they send every month and also on both the, C the California Library Association and the American Library Association websites. Um, I'm sure there are probably other additional ways or maybe even better ways to track legislation than that um, but it's you know it's been interesting and it's kind of uh, however much work a person would want to put into it I suppose I think something coming up that might um, involve that role is a day in the district that happens in March I believe so I'm not sure if we've participated in day in the district before no.
board is doing um, with strategic planning, you know, and facilities, everything um, that's positive, I think we have an opportunity to try to get back on their good side. <laughs> um, and I think for the government relations liaison to, you know, try to just uh, work on those relationships, you know, along with the director to kind of get back in, you know, just to have a good working relationship and good line of communication with, like, Susie Neymar, Catherine Barger's office, or Chris Holden's office, or Tarantino. I think that um, would be a good, you know, good idea. And I, I think the industry would be a good opportunity mm -hmm. to maybe reach out to them and, make, you know, invite them. Which is, by the way, in case people haven't heard of it, is the opportunity to go meet with legislators, legislators in their local offices. And then there's also, I know CLA has the opportunity to, to go to Sacramento as well. I don't know if we, we would want to do that. But those are the pieces of it as far as I understand it. So I know, Betsy, your sort of tenure as um, government relations liaison is fairly new. Um, do you feel like you would like to continue in that role? I would or? I would be happy to unless there's somebody who's just a political wonk and would love to right. have that experience. I, I I feel like I'm it's not necessarily my nature, so I'm learning. <laughs> and, you know, I'm learning how to how to go about it. So, it, you know, if it, again, kind of like Terry, I mean, I'm happy to keep doing it unless somebody is it would really like to try it. That would be fine too. Well then, um, if I may, I'd like to ask you to continue in that okay. capacity. Um, Terry, I think your, your point is well made that having a little bit of shuffling makes sense. So I wonder if you would be willing to uh, take over as liaison to the friends. Sure. Okay, fantastic. And then, Jason, that leaves either you or me as the foundation person. I know you have a lot of facilities stuff on your plate, so I'm happy to do foundation, or if you prefer, that's cool too. Um, I mean, if you think you've got the time with, with I think it's fairly low key, and I think they're, they've done a lot, a lot of their stuff has been strategic planning related. Okay. So now that that's kind of coming to its conclusion, that should be. Can I ask before, before you finalize that, yeah. is, is it not even appropriate to con consider Gwen to be a liaison when she's already, when she's on the foundation? Is that, are both those things mutually is exclusive? She's she she had been on the foundation. I don't think she is still. I don't know how we're. Uh, yeah, I. If she is, it's sort of a tenuous okay. connection, yeah. I think, right now. Uh, that's a good point, though, about about Gwen and what she might want to do. Or I mean, I'll accept it for now, and when you know we want to revisit it in January when. when we can do yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's let's have those appointments just as kind of placeholders and then we can come back in yeah. January and finalize them. I, like that. okay. I think that's nice because I want to make sure she is included as well. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good idea. Okay. So we'll bring that back on the January agenda. And then that brings us to 8H, the updated salary schedule, which is an information item. an update to our salary schedule based on the increase in the state minimum wage, not the county minimum wage. And I think I mentioned that the last time we adjusted the salary schedule for minimum wage. Currently, as a government entity, we are allowed to follow the state minimum wage instead of the county minimum wage. The county is currently higher than the state. Um, it wasn't always an issue. There wasn't always a county minimum wage and the discrepancy was not always so great. It is getting greater. Um, so for now, I think this is the appropriate step for us. The county minimum wage actually increases um, on a fiscal year schedule. So that will increase July 1 of 2020. And by then we'll have the comp study completed. And I think that would be an appropriate time for us to discuss revamping the entire salary schedule to meet the Los Angeles county minimum wage rather than the state. Makes sense. And do just uh, as a reminder's sake, um, the proposed, the, the new 13, that's just for new hires, right? So like 
do, how does this work? Do folks move to the following steps on their anniversary date? Is that? Yes, so for every successful evaluation that they complete, they get moved okay. to the next step. questions for Nicole. This is just a review and file, so we don't have a, an action to take on this, but in case there are any questions or concerns. And presumably when we um, are looking at the 2021 budget, we would take into account the impact that, that would have. So, yes. okay. Great, thank you. So that is it for new business. Um, no correspondence in the packet that I'm aware of unless there's anything else, okay. Um, for proposed future agenda items, I know we're bringing back the liaisons, um, and other than that, strategic, strategic yes, yeah, strategic plan, plan part two. A potential um, operating plan or based on the strategic plan. Like goals and objectives for oh, department. Yeah. yeah. Betsy, you and I can have a meeting with Nikki and figure that out. Um, and then on the January agenda, we'll have the results of the audit. Yes, or we'll we'll have that by then. And will we will we be doing mid-year budget adjustment well, in January, or is that going to be February? What I would love to do would be that short, you know, like that second or third week in January, have that meeting, and then make whatever recommendations come out of that. And that would be the mid-year budget adjustment. But the audit would be. A yeah, I'm just I'm realizing I have a question about the budget committee. Um, I kind of automatically joined the budget committee when I became president, <laughs> and then I stayed on it when Terry became president. And right. so I'm wondering if it's either custom or you know if it yeah. if it is the case that the and I think it logically does make sense for the president to be on the budget committee. Right. And if that's the case, is it a committee that can have more than two trustees? Uh, it can. And should it's it? A, and if, it's a, and it's it can't stand standing committee. Okay. So it could have as many. Yeah. yeah. Um, as we learned, that appointment was not agendized, so maybe we can agendize that for um, January. For the budget committee. Yeah, for the budget committee, but I'll come to the okay. meeting. Um, and because it's a noticed for yeah, a meeting, yeah. it doesn't matter. I, I, but just, yeah, I was you just thinking through that the history and realizing it sort of happened automatically, but right. now we need to actually think right. about it. That's a good point. I mean, theoretically, since it's a special meeting with an agenda, none of us have to miss all the fun. No, we could all be there. That's true. Yeah. Put it on your calendar, Jason. You don't want to miss out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you journeying now? Because <laughs> i got to go short books. All right. That being the case. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I'll second that. All right, moved and seconded. Any objection? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a the what?